Well, I've got technology with me this morning. I have my phone. Not to uh, check my, uh, my emails or anything like that, but can you see what I've got written up on here? 20 minutes. I've been told very, quite often, uh, subtly and very directly, that I have 20 minutes to speak with you this morning. And um, so I'm going to do my best to stick to 20 minutes. What I have not been told is how many sermons I can do in one service. So we're going to do three sermons this morning, all right? 20 minutes long, keeping through the criteria in which I've been given. But before we uh, get into the message, I haven't hit start yet, okay? Because I haven't started, all right? This is just the warm-up. This is the free part of the service. Now, I want to welcome everyone. It's good to have you guys here. Um, I've got my little bipper, so I've never done this before, so something to learn. But uh, the reason I want to welcome you is that not only are we a loving community, but also I want to welcome us into the presence of the Lord. We don't come just to service just to hear a half good looking guy from Sydney come and speak or hear some fantastic singers. We come because we want to meet with God, we want to be strengthened. And so as you're welcoming, I want to welcome you to our community, but welcome you into the presence of the Lord this morning and that we can prepare ourselves to hear what the Lord might want to say to each one of us this morning. For those that are new here or haven't been here or can't remember what we do after the service, when we exit those doors out there, we just walk right down the side of the church and down the back we have fantastic cookies. Uh, If we're lucky, we might get some banana bread, my favourite and some beautiful tea and coffee, but most of all, just some uh, lovely conversations and people to meet. So please come and join us uh, afterwards. Also, I want to welcome you onto, on the web, onto the computer, those that are watching online, whether that be right now or afterwards, we want to welcome you. And uh, even though you may not be here with us, we do pray that the Lord will meet with you during this service today. So it's good to have you guys here. If you are uh, online watching for us, love for you to uh, get in contact with us. You can see on your screen that there's an email address. Drop a line and say hello. Tell us what you got from the service or any questions you have. Or you can also, if you're watching through YouTube, who gets uh, faithfully uh, emailed to us every, every week, um, feel free to leave a, a comment in the YouTube section as well. Um, as it's already been communicated at the start of the service, Easter is coming up. And as you can see on the screens there, we have a 9 o'clock service uh, on the Friday and a 10 o'clock on the Sunday. Now, I want to remind you of that because it is coming up quickly. But two, I also want to encourage us as a church. Let's just not rock up to church just another Sunday, another Easter. But let's start to think about how can we come to church on this Easter period? Who are those people that I rub shoulders with on a day-to-day basis? Who's my neighbours? Who's that person the Lord's brought into my life? And think about how can we invite them to come and celebrate this incredible time of our faith? For those that uh, want to really get into the preparation, uh, the uh, Encounter uh, Lutheran Church uh, do a, uh, what do you call it? Stations of the Cross, that big bold lettering up there. Stations of the Cross. It's 12 steps to help us enter in to this season that we celebrate called Easter. So if you have the opportunity and chance, I would highly recommend that. Just so that we don't allow Easter to go through and it becomes all about Easter eggs and hot cross buns and busyness. And we get at the end going, did I actually think about Jesus this year? So this is a great opportunity for us to really uh, focus our hearts and mind to celebrate. All right, for those that are keen, which is a lot of you, we also have the uh, Easter sunrise service. Again, I want to encourage you to come and be along with that. The wonderful thing about that is it's not just our community, but it's the broader church of Victor Harbour in the region. So let's come and celebrate together, not just as Church of Christ, but as believers of Jesus death and resurrection so come and celebrate with us in the morning there so my question to you guys this morning is how have you come to church this morning me i've come a little nervous 
as I've been told multiple times, this is my first sermon here. I'm not too nervous because I know you guys will love me even if I uh, make a mess of it. Won't you? Yeah. Okay, fuel. that's good. A little worried when there's a silence there. Like, hmm. Some of you have come. <laughs> hey, Lawrence, how are you? Some of you have come with this expectation to hear from the new guy. I wonder how he's going to do. Is it the way I like sermons done? Do I agree with his saying? Do I disagree with what he's saying? Maybe you got your little 10, 9, 8 card. Yep, that was an 8 that point, 9 for that point. Maybe you got distractions. Maybe you've had a hard week. Maybe your health has been really troubling you. Maybe you've got some really heavy, weighty things on your heart. We all come to church with different baggage, with different things, don't we? As we sit in church, there's nothing we can do about that right now. But there is one thing we can do, is we can choose the posture of our heart and how we choose to enter in to what the Lord wants to say. And I pray this morning that my words are not my words, but the words of the Holy Spirit. And that as they go out and they fall on you, the Lord might speak to you and encourage you. Confront us, convict us, encourage us to be the people that God has called us to be. But one thing I'm confident of is that Jesus is alive. He is present with us and he wants to meet with us. So can I pray? Lord, thank you for this incredibly beautiful bunch of people. And as we come into this place, we want to meet with you. We want to be encouraged by you. We want to hear what you have to say to us so that we can continue to be vessels to build your kingdom. Lord, I pray for myself that as I speak, there'll be your words. And I pray for the ears that hear that they will be filtered through the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, let's see where we're up to. Palm Sunday. We look at this picture, we see people laying down their palm leaves. We see people welcoming Jesus on the back of a donkey. But when they looked at the, the person Jesus on the back of the donkey, what did they see? See, for the Jewish people, they've been oppressed by many different nations and uh, authorities and leaders over the years. And at this current time, there's a Roman Empire, as we all well know. And the hope was that there's this going to be this Messiah, this anointed one, that will come and set them free, that will finally deliver them from their oppressors and become a nation with their own king. And as they looked at Jesus, I am sure that this is what they saw. They saw a man that was going to deliver them from these, the Roman Empire. See, at first when Jesus hit the scene, he didn't really have the characteristics and behaviours of a leader that would do that. But as the stories got around, as the people started to hear what Jesus was doing, they started to recognise that this man was a man of authority. That this man could do things that no one else could do. And they went, you know what, maybe he is the Messiah, maybe he is the anointed one. Because no one has this sort of authority, no one has this sort of wisdom. No one reminded me. Oh, so I just got five minutes of extra time in there. Hey, sneaky, wasn't it? But they had a certain image of who Jesus was meant to be. wonder what their images were. Maybe their image was this. A bit more of a superman. A real person who will face danger. Who would combat adversity through courage and strength, overthrow the Roman Empire. Maybe a warrior, a little bit like King David, who overcame this Goliath, this great enemy, and slayed him. 
Maybe it was, they thought he was going to be a conqueror who would rally all the people together and go, all right, enough is enough. It is time that we became our own nation with our own king again. Let's rally together. Let's get our numbers and let's overcome through military force the Roman Empire. Maybe that's who they saw when they saw Jesus riding in on that donkey. But instead, they weren't welcoming a warrior or a conqueror or a hero. They were welcoming in a man who was love. And I can't read that up there, so I'm going to look at my notes right now. But they're welcoming in love. And it says in John, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. You know, as I uh, just went through the slides and we picked up warrior and we picked up hero and we picked out conqueror. We know now in hindsight that this is not who Jesus was, but he was a man of love. But I wonder sometimes, do we really still want the warrior? Do we really still want the hero? Do we really still want the conqueror? Because as we look at the world, as we read and we watch the news, we see things out there and we're like, why can't God just wipe that? Why can't he just destroy that people? Why can't he just do these things? Yet even know that we know Jesus down. Over the palm leaves. We know that that's not the type of God that he is. Sometimes we still hope that he would be that. Because it would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? Why is it important that we celebrate Palm Sunday? Because it reminds us that he's not in the sense that we want him to be a hero a conqueror. This is a Jesus of love. He says, this is how we defeat. This is how we overcome. This is how we do stuff. Not by the way, but the ways of the kingdom. And love laying down our lives. He's a king of humility. He's a humble king. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find the rest. You will find rest for your souls. See, when they're welcoming Jesus on the donkey, they're welcoming, saying, In me is rest. Not fighting, not struggling, but rest. I've got my microphone on. I feel like I'm supposed to be a dancer and a singer. So, Welcome in a patient king. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's a patient God. That he works in our time, in his timing, not our timing. He waits to see your baby. He waits for the Italian factory. Could be. Oh, I'm back again. There we go. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger said, I'll be back. But he's a patient, took his time, listened, heard, met with people, was not in a hurry to be able to tell them what their rights and wrongs were, but was patient to help them go from where they were into a place of meeting with his heavenly father. He was patient. He wanted people to have rest. He took time to eat 
with the sinners. He took time to sit and talk to people about what God really was like. He's a God of peace, a king of peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. They welcomed in the king of peace. Where we could come into his presence and despite all the things going in our life, can breathe and go, Jesus is for me. Jesus is with me. He didn't say, I'm going to remove you from your problems. But what he did say is, I'm going to bring you peace while you walk through your problems. And I'll stand there with you and walk with you. This is what Palm Sunday is about, is welcoming in a Jesus, a king that is like this. Unknowingly, as Jesus was riding on their donkey, when they threw down their palms, what they didn't realise is they said, we welcome a king that sits with the liars and the thieves of our society. We welcome a king that mourns with the broken hearted. We welcome a king that cares for the hungry and the needy. We care for a king that worries about the lost and the homeless. We're welcoming in a king that loves the refugees, those that are different to us. Those that society looks at and go, hey, you're a bit weird. We don't like the way you do things. The king goes, I welcome you. You have a place in my house. They welcomed in a king that removed all obstacles so that you, so that I, that every person outside of these walls could meet with the creator of the universe. Not in a certain way, not by performing certain things or dealing with certain stuff, but he said, I've dealt with it all. I'm going to deal with it all. And I'm going to open up a door so that you don't have to jump through hoops anymore. To go through people, but you can come to me directly. When they're welcomed in Jesus, they're welcomed in a new way of life. Jesus, I think, best says it this way. When we welcome a new way, he says, I have come that you may have life. That's why he's come, so that you may have life. Is that not exciting? Is that where the scripture finishes? Is there more to it? What is it, Meg? You can have it to the full. See, Jesus didn't come, he didn't ride in on his donkey just so that you could exist, so that you could just breathe and have a heartbeat and just go through your day-to-day -day life hoping that the next day might be different to the day before, hoping that things might be different. He didn't come so that you could just live and be but he came and he said, I've given you life and life to the fullest. When we read other translations, it says life in its fullness, abundantly. I love that word. I've come to give life and life abundantly. More and better life than they have ever dreamed, dreamed of. A greater life. Or I like how the passion puts it. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect. Life in its fullness 
until you overflow. As believers, as we welcome this, this is what Jesus is saying. That I have given you life and you can have it abundantly, overflowing the fullness of life. We want to build this church. We want to see the church be known for who it really is. Tell me one person that doesn't want to experience that very scripture. Isn't that what the world is already seeking? A life of abundance. I'm going to be extreme and jump off a cliff without a parachute. I'm going to travel the world and do this. People are naturally built and desire to live life abundantly. Yet Jesus is saying there's only one way to fully live a life of abundance. And that's through me. That's who they welcomed. My question to us, if we want people to believe that, we first must believe it ourselves. And belief is action. As a church, are we living life abundantly? Who can answer that for you? Only you and God. Not the person to your left, not your right, not your spouse, not Pastor Peter. Only you before the Lord know whether you're living the fullness of the promise that God has given you. So, therefore, we've finally got to the today's reading. Therefore, what's the question when you see therefore? You ask yourself, is why is it therefore? Well, it's therefore because the previous three chapters was reminding us of what we've just been speaking about. How good, how mighty, how great Jesus is. That his way of life is a new way of life. And that you know this, you experience. So therefore, as you know this stuff, as you're aware of these things, therefore, live a life worthy of this calling. Because you know this, you have the secrets, you have the gold. Therefore, live a life worthy of this calling. Jesus best says it like this. How do we live a life worthy of this calling? Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. How do we live a life worthy of this calling? is taking that knowledge of everything that we've been speaking about this morning and applying it to our life and then going, what's God doing right now? And how do I fulfill what he is speaking? I remember once being challenged by this and I was on the way to school. And uh, not my, I wasn't at school. I was taking my kids to school. And as I was taking them to school, I saw this uh, lady... And she was having an argument at the front of the high school that we walked past with her son. And it was one of those arguments where you're like, this is not one of those arguments you want to have with your children full stop, let alone in public. We got Judah and Micah off to school. And as I came back, I could see her on the phone and she was quite distressed. And as I was getting closer to her, she hung up the phone and I... My heart started racing. <laughs> I had to get back. I was running a ministry. I was having to get things done. I had to drop my kids off of school. I was beelining. But my heart started to beat. And so I stopped in front of the lady and I said, Look, I've worked with kids for a long time. It's not as bad as it seems. And she just burst into tears. And so I had an opportunity just to chat with her. I said, what are you doing right now? She goes, oh, I'm just waiting for a friend. I said, well, let's go get a coffee. There's a coffee shop about 20 metres up the road. We got a coffee and we just sat and we talked while she waited for a friend. Remember another time, uh, when I was ministering to this lady, who was I, minister who was I when I was ministering to her? 
Was I a missionary? Was I a pastor? No, I was just a dad. A dad taking his kids to school. And the Lord said, hey, here's an opportunity for you to encourage. Here's an opportunity for you to speak and bring the kingdom to this lady. I wasn't anyone important. Well, I am, because dad's important. But my title was just a dad, just a regular old dad that probably yelled at his kids that morning, hurry up, we're running late for school. <laughs> Judah's nodding. <laughs> Remember another time my mum was coming over and being an incredible organiser, I'd never got her a present of flowers or anything like that. And she's coming over to our house for dinner, so I quickly ran up the street to IGA and I got myself two big grocery bags full of food to do a beautiful dinner for my mum's birthday. And as I was walking, like, Flowers would be a good idea right now. So I've got some flowers and then I like, and for whatever reason, I needed some money. And um, I don't even know why I went in the bank. I probably didn't have enough hands to use the ATM machine. So I probably had in my, Scrooge, can I get some money out and let the lady. So I walked in there and I did my banking and there wasn't a single line. And as I walked up to the counter, the young lady behind says, oh, those flowers for me? I went, oh, no, they're for my mum, I'm sorry. She goes, oh, I've never got flowers before. I'm like, oh. So in a rush, I got the stuff and I'm walking out. And what did the Lord do? So still walking because I was running late, ignoring what the Lord was doing. I walked past the florist and went, you know what, I'm just going to buy. And I noticed there's another teller over there. She was a female. So I went and said, can I just get two bunch of flowers? So I got the bunches of flowers, turned around, went back into the Commonwealth Bank. And guess what? There's like 20 people in a line. <laughs> So I stood there in the line, I'm like, I can't wait for this. And so I could see that one teller was wrapping, the lady that said, oh, these flowers for me, she was wrapping it all up with a customer. So I just went, sorry, guys, sorry, and ran past everyone, jumped line, and I'm sure everyone was ready to stab me in the back. And I just went straight up. I said, look, love, you just need to know you are worthy of flowers, and so are you worthy of flowers, and know that God loves you. And then I turned around and detailed out of there really quickly. <laughs> but before I did, you could just see the lady's eyes welling up with tears. That someone noticed her. And that she knew it was God that noticed her. Who was I just then? Just a son trying to get a meal for his mum and some flowers to say, I love you. But as I was a son, the Lord said, hey, I've got something for you. How do we live our lives? Do we live our lives in such a way that we're able to see God and do nothing but what we see the Father do? A life, live a life worthy of this calling. I'm running out of time, so I want to figure out what I'm going to skip for you. Probably nothing. Human body, organ system. Paul goes on in his writings that we heard this morning, there's Barry read so wonderfully this morning, about the body. And, it's, you know, and he uses this body as a description because he knows that everyone understands it. And he indicates in his shows the body has many functions. It has legs, it has arms, it has hearts, it has livers, and they all have many functions. And when they function together, they become one, the body. See, in this scripture that Barry read out, Paul says that people have been given certain gifts and talents. And those gifts and talents are there to, to strengthen the body, to serve the body, to encourage the body, to equip the body, to move the body. That these gifts and talents, is, talents are to help the body to do ministry. We all have jobs. Some of us fix cars. Some of us herd cows and milk cows. Some of us build shelter. Some of us teach children. Some of us 
are retired. You have faithfully worked, you have done many years of service to the community and your family and yourselves, and you've earned the right to retire. And that's a worthy place in life. And we respect that. And you should enjoy that. But that's your function, like the ones who fixes the car and grows the crops. Some of us are called to serve and to be servers. And we do that through morning tea and through coffee and through palm leaves and beautiful decorations and videos and worship. And we serve in that capacity. We all have functions of the body and we all need to operate in those functions so that this community here exists. And without each one of you playing your role in those functions, it's hard for the body to exist. But we are all called to minister the Spirit of God. See, when someone comes to this church and they go, who's the minister of this church? You can go, I am. We all are. And when you get pushed back from that visitor going, no, 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 no. No, who's the, who's the real minister of this church? You know what you can say? Oh, the person. Let me get this right. The one whose life is worthy of the call. Well, who is the one that is worthy of that call? Ryan Booker, Meg, John, Rob, Adriel. We put our names in that place. Who are the ones that are worthy to be the ministers of his spirit? You and I, followers, welcomers of Jesus. What an incredible privilege it is. It takes a lot of pressure off Peter and myself. We don't have to be the ministers anymore because we've got a church full of ministers now. So whose responsibility is it to minister to this community called Victor Harbour? Yours. Some of us are here uh, to fix cars and some of us are here to preach the gospel, to strengthen you, to encourage you so that we all could be ministers of the gospel, the good news. So as I finish this morning, my friends, as I lay down this challenge, as you rise from your seats and you go and you have your morning tea and you go into this week, my question I want to leave with you this morning is how will you minister the Spirit of God this week? Or do you have excuses? Have you placed obstacles in front of you why you can't do that? Because what Jesus said is, I've removed those obstacles. So you don't need to worry about them no more. No more can there be excuses. See, so as we welcome Jesus on Palm Sunday, the obstacles aren't there anymore. The only obstacles are there, the ones that we put there. And you know what the great thing is about that? Is that you also have the power to remove them. Do you want to see this kingdom come in Victor Harbour? Well, guess what? Jesus is saying to you, you can minister the kingdom in this place. So as I pray, I want to ask and invite you if you feel like the Lord is speaking you or convicting you after the service, I'm going to be down the front. I'm sure Pastor Peter will be available and some of the leaders of the church will be available. And if you want prayer, we'd love to pray for you. But I have anticipation that God wants to use this church to build his kingdom. I'm not talking about whether you're saved or not. I'm talking about will you be ministers of the kingdom of God this week? Can we pray? Lord, thank you for these beautiful people. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul who encourages the Ephesians to say that you are the ministers of the gospel in Ephesus. 
And just as we read from Paul today, you would say to us, people of Victor Harbour, you are the ministers of my kingdom to these people. So live a life worthy of the call. So Lord, would you strengthen us today to be those people? In Jesus' name.